This is Join Us in France, episode 39. Hello, I'm Annie. And I'm Elise. And we welcome you to the Join Us in France travel podcast. Elise is a professional tour guide, art historian, and a really good storyteller. And we're going to M today. <laughs> oh, M, okay. Well, today on today's show, we have a double theme. We are talking about Montparnasse. And Halloween in France. This, since we are recording this right before Halloween and releasing it right before Halloween, it made sense. And also, Montparnasse is a place that has creepy things. So, which, which she loves. Yes, I do like a, a couple of creepy things. Even though in France we don't really celebrate Halloween that much. There are children who like to do it and there are grown-up parties also. But it's not a, a big part of French life in, no. in general. <clears throat> but we do have some fabulous cemeteries. And one of them is in Montparnasse. So we'll talk about that. Okay, to see the pictures for the creepy places, <laughs> you need to go to joinusinfrance.com forward slash 39. And now we'll have a little music and we'll come right back and talk about all of that. Okay, we're back to talk about Montparnasse and creepy places. Yeah, you're, you're more interested in the creepy places than I am. Well, the other place I didn't even mention in the introduction is the catacombs, and of the course. Catacombs. And we'll get to that at the end and of we'll the show. And we'll talk about yeah. those at the... Yeah, both yeah. of them, actually, at the end. Okay. Uh, this is the, the... There's the three M's, you know, uh, of Paris. And one is uh, Montmartre, which we've done. Mm -hmm. And the second one is Marais, the Marais, which mm -hmm. is another neighborhood. And this is the third one, Montparnasse. Those Montparnasse. are the three M's, huh? mm -hmm. like, like doing a mantra. Uh, <laughs> And uh, this is this one's interesting because it's it's really different from the other two, in that it's not one of the most ancient neighborhoods. It's not in the dead center. The region or neighborhood of Montparnasse is actually in the south and slight west. It's mostly in the arrondissement, which is the 14th, but it actually overlays into a little bit of the uh, 6th and a little bit of the 15th. It's There are two different things. One is a very small neighborhood that has a lot of the historical things, which basically starts uh, from the cemetery and ends, in fact, at the catacombs. Mm -hmm. And the other is a larger area that is the generic uh, name for this whole district. So okay. there are two. And uh, it's interesting because <clears throat> the name was given to the region actually starting at the end of the 1600s, by university students. This, these are the students from the Sorbonne and all of the Latin Quarter, which is really a, just next to this area. You can actually walk from, from one to the other. Okay. And apparently, in a spirit of cynicism and irony, uh, mm -hmm. uh, they were, um, and, and rambunctiousness, I guess, you know. <laughs> I mean, university students are always pretty much like that anyway. Yep. You, know, you have to remember in the 1600s, of course, it was young men of privileged families anyway. Um, they, they, they went to this area, which was basically mostly countryside, and which had lots of piles of gravel that were mounted up very high, like small hills, hmm. because there had been a lot of uh, digging done in the Middle Ages. There were uh, excavations done underground. And so there were these huge piles that were very artificial that they decided to ironically call Montparnasse, like the uh, mountain in Greece, meaning the place where oh. the gods, you know, announce very wise oh, things and everything. Okay. And so this was in a spirit of total derision <laughs> okay. uh, that they would go out there because apparently a whole group of these students had been basically thrown off the uh, what would have been the campus of the Sorbonne for being a little bit too much like this. Uh -huh. And so they went to this area and they would uh, get up on top of these piles and start making these pronouncements, you know, and these philosophical oh, okay. comments and everything else. All right. All so right. The, the actual name is an ironic name, which is very interesting <laughs> because it's probably the only part of Paris whose name comes from some kind of ironical thing. <laughs> and the name stuck, see? And so it became yeah, the a this, good name. first it was a nickname. 
In fact, I don't know if it ever had an, any other real name, uh, but it became known generically as the Montparnasse area because of these students. Mm. And, and then starting in the 1700s, when uh, the city of Paris started expanding, they cut through a street which is considered to be the, the longest street in all of Paris, which is the Rue Vaugirard, Vaugirard, yes. and which goes across from the 15th to the 14th to the 6th, and I think ends actually at the beginning of the 5th. So it really is very, very long. Mm -hmm. And this is where they're starting to actually build things and make nice, beautiful mansions in the styles of the you know, 1700s and everything. But the name stuck. I think that's really fabulous. And they say that this hill existed at exactly an intersection that exists right now. And that is uh, really a great place to begin a walk. And we'll eventually put on online uh, the, the coordinates so that you can do a really nice walk in this area. Mm -hmm. And that is the intersection of Boulevard Montparnasse and Boulevard Raspai. And to see that, you'll have to go to joinusinfrance.com forward slash 39. Right. Yeah. So then what happened was, it was actually only in the 19th century, in the middle of the 1800s, that this stopped being just a rural area, really mm -hmm. outside of the walls and, you know, all of old Paris, yeah. because yeah. it really is not that far from the Latin Quarter and no. Saint-Germain, you know, no. uh, at least part of it, because it's, it happens that this is a large it's big, area. Yeah. It's big. So, you know, we can't talk about all of it, but there are some really nice things and that are historically interesting to see. And the official name for the area that's the most interesting part actually is a designation from 1860. Mm -hmm. And it was given that name so that there's the region that's Montparnasse and then this neighborhood that's Montparnasse. And one of the reasons why is because it was in the middle of the 19th century that lots of artists started uh, hanging out there and working there. And, and in fact, what happened was that originally uh, most of these artists were up in Montmartre, Mm -hmm. which is literally the other end of Paris. I mean, mm -hmm. it's going from the extreme north almost of, to the south uh, on slight western side. If you, you know, see so Paris is kind of like a circle. And when that got too crowded and too popular, they started <laughs> looking for another place to they go. They migrated. And, and, you know, I'm from New York and I, I lived through a period of time where this was true in New York City and it is still true. Uh, when you have a neighborhood that artists, that they move into, it's usually a neighborhood that's inexpensive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they, and to they begin with, to begin with. And, right. then, and then what <laughs> happens is either because the artists wind up became, becoming well known or because other people think it's really cool to move into those neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. the, what happens is that the real estate gets more expensive and they get chased yeah. out and they have to go somewhere else. And this is exactly what happened in Paris. Mm -hmm. So basically the Montparnasse that you will hear about, read about and talk about in relation to artists, writers and anybody else is really a part that belongs to the end of the 19th century and the 20th century. So uh, that's why we're not going to cover all of it because it's just much too big. And yeah. it's also... Because of that, it's not a part that has any real medieval, you know, sections. It's all right. big, Newer. wide, beautiful boulevards yeah. and big buildings. And so uh, this is an area that's airy, you know, yes. in the sense that it's not tiny little narrow streets or anything like that. It's it's very nice area to walk around. But again, it is a very big area. Right. So um, And it I, has a big tower. Yeah, it has a big Montparnasse tower. That's not very nice looking. I mean, not to me anyway. Well, the, the whole thing about the tower of Montparnasse is that, uh, and this for, for those people who have never yet been t to Paris, uh, this was a big, big tower that was built in the 1970s. And it is 60 stories high. Mm -hmm. And it is built in this very modern monolithic style of architecture. It's really quite uh, unattractive in, in, yeah. in its form. And it was the first time that the city tried to put a skyscraper inside the city, inside the, literally the, the old city itself. Yeah. And it created such an uproar. <laughs> it really did. I mean, it, it just created such an uproar because it was in order to build it and to build the, the uh, commercial center nearby. And then, of course, the brand new train station of Montparnasse, right, which right. is all made out of cement and, and everything else. They, they entirely raised a huge old neighborhood that was very picturesque, that was uh. very beautiful. And it was a neighborhood where there was a huge number of people from Brittany. 
Mm. It was traditionally a region that had a lot of people from Brittany and they were little shopkeepers and they had their little cafes and bars and things yeah. like that. And, and it created really an uproar, so much so that the city created a new ordinance or they changed whatever the ordinance was and they made it a law that uh, in the city center, which includes almost everything except the 15th arrondissement, interestingly enough, there, were no, there was no longer a possibility to build tall buildings. Yeah, there, Paris is not a skyscraper city. No. It has a bit of a skyline if you go to La Défense. Right. But uh, city, this, the rest of the city doesn't have much, except for La Tour Montparnasse. Except for the Tour Montparnasse and, of course, the Eiffel Tower, which is well, something else. But that's not a skyscraper. Right. Yeah. right. <laughs> but, but what happened was, now the Tour of Montparnasse still exists, and it is oh, a yeah. place you can go up to the top to get a view. Now, the interesting thing is I would prefer that people go to the Eiffel Tower or to Sacré-Cœur yes. because it's not only getting a great view of the rooftops and the entire configuration of the city, but it's, it's not this... Really, it's really ugly. I mean, the Tower of Montparnasse yeah, is really yeah. ugly. However, if you want a view looking north of all the entire city, this is the place to go. Right, and it, also if you want to have the Eiffel Tower in your pictures, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Don't if you stand on the Eiffel Tower, you will not you will see, not it see it, it on your pictures. No, and uh, you don't so. get to see it from the Sacré Cœur either because Sacré Cœur is uh -huh. too further west, uh, east. Yes, so it is a good place to go up to the top yeah. to get a great view. But it's very interesting because uh, it is uh, a, a, it's like a big monolith, like out of a movie that sticks up. It's black glass and everything, mm -hmm. and you can see it from almost anywhere in the city and uh literally it was it was what put a stop so you're right the defense la defense is where all these new big skyscrapers are going up on the uh, western edge outside right. the old city right and there's a little bit in the 15th because that's also the western side where they allowed all these companies to put their headquarters mm -hmm. uh but but they're now starting to fight now that there's a new mayor again um, there's a lot of uh, impetus to try and change these rules, but actually, I personally hope that they don't because Paris is beautiful because the uh, outlying areas have the modern new structures and the inlying areas have all these beautiful old neighborhoods old, yeah. and it's really nice that way you yeah know? yeah so uh but and it those, is a great and, landmark and those know? big skyscrapers do have a big footprint i mean they do take up a lot of yeah you know city blocks and they uh, right they take up city blocks and hard to ignore <laughs> and and they make they really involve the destruction of lots of things around them mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm. but it is one of the landmarks of course of the it is basically the outer edge, in a way, of the Montparnasse area. Yeah. But but one of the other things that uh, is fun to do, it, it this is an area that is a really great walking area, but big stride walking. You know, this is not the little narrow streets like in the Marais or even up in Montmartre. Mm -hmm. And uh, part of it is because it became this area that was frequented by all these artists and then writers, first at the end of the century. So you have all of these people like... Uh, Renoir and all, um, Matisse and all these artists who basically gave up on Montmartre because it started to become too crowded, too touristy, even at the end of the 19th century, right. uh, and too expensive. Mm -hmm. And they moved down to this area where it was basically, oh, there's nothing here. We can have our studios. Exactly. And so, of course, guess what happened? Of course, all these other artists started showing up. And so <laughs> you get all these famous artists from the beginning of the 20th century mm -hmm. who, are, uh, who lived there. And that includes people like Modigliani, the Italian artist. Oh, okay. Picasso made it his base in Paris mm. and entirely lived in the Montparnasse area. Mm -hmm. And as soon as he moved in, all of the other artists that were friends with him and that knew him moved in as well. So if yeah. you want to have it, there's an inventory of all of the artists of the early 20th century. Their hangout area was Montparnasse. And it includes... Um, man who's actually originally from a town right near where we are, which is uh, Antoine Bordel. He was from Montauban, mm -hmm. and he became a very famous sculptor. And a lot of people may have seen his sculpture because it's all these nice round figures, these nice round oh, forms yes, and everything. Yes. And he was a very good friend of uh, all of these artists, and he had his studio, which has now become a small museum of his sculpture, and it is in the Montparnasse area. So cool. there was a whole development of an artist colony, and it included a place that's really on the edge of Montparnasse. And I have to be honest and admit that I've always wanted to go there, and I never have, not yet anyway. Mm -hmm. And it's called La Ruche, which means the beehive. Okay. And it was created by uh, an entrepreneur, a man who was basically a businessman, who, uh, and this is, of course, 
n nothing new, but it's amazing that they did this. He created out of nothing. There was apparently land that had nothing built on it. He created an artist colony uh, for these artists at the beginning of the 20th century and that uh, basically gave uh, studio space with cheap rent mm. because he wanted a place that all these artists could hang out and mix. And I guess he was right. a patron of the arts. And it still exists. That's cool. Uh, and apparently there was a chance that it was going to be uh, destroyed because it's all this beautiful art, nouveau architecture and everything. And then it got saved by the city of Paris. And now it still has artists who are... I think they have to put in an, a request to have a space have to apply. there, okay. right? Okay. But they do have a lot of space for artists, and apparently you can only go there by requesting a chance to go in. It's not open. It's not like a museum that's open to the public. But it yeah. just it adds to this kind of atmosphere of art stuff that's in yeah. the in the Montparnasse area. Yeah, that's cool. And the other thing that's really famous there and still exists. And again, it's really fun to do, but you have to be careful because you have to have a little bit of money in your pocket to go to <laughs> at least one, if not all of these. And that is uh, on the corner of the Boulevard of Montparnasse and right near Denfer Rochereau, which is right near where the catacombs are. Yes. Uh, starting at the very beginning of the 20th century, there were these enormous, gorgeous cafe brasseries that were built that are gorgeous to see because they all still exist. And they're either Art Nouveau or Art Deco. Mm -hmm. And there are four of them. And they're all within, uh, they're all on uh, Boulevard Montparnasse. And they're like within throwing pebble distance of one another. <laughs> I can even, I can tell you that one is at 99, one is at 102, one is at 105, and one is at 108. So <laughs> talk about competition. They're yeah, all well. huge, you know. And do you know the names so of the, any of them? So the, the first one that was built in 1903 is the Rotunda. Okay. These are all still there, and they're worth going just once to at least one of them because this is where all the artists hung out and then all these writers. So first there was the Rotunda in 1903. Then in 1906, the Dome. Mm -hmm. Then in 1920, the Coupole, mm -hmm. the Cupola. They all have this idea of dome, rotunda. Yeah, it, it's it has, all interesting. <laughs> and then the last one, which was built in 1925 and which became Art Deco, not Art Nouveau, is the Select. Okay. And all of these are, to this day, wonderfully gorgeous uh, places where you have the typical brasserie food. And because this is an area that originally was founded by a lot of people from Brittany, they're all famous for their seafood, their mm. seafood platters. Uh, you can also just go and hang out and have a coffee and pretend... You're in Woody Allen's movie, Midnight in Paris, because that's where he filmed some of the oh. scenes because it shows that this is where Hemingway Faulkner and Gertrude Stein and all these writers hung out. Oh, very good. But it's not cheap. Well, it's not cheap because... Brasserie usually is cheap. That's why it's important to point it right, out. Point it out. Because <laughs> Those are not the cheap ones. These are not the cheap ones. These are not the cheap ones, number one, because well, of the decoration. Seafood, too. That's expensive. And because they have the authentic decor inside them, which mm -hmm. is uh, mostly Art Nouveau, but some of it is Art Deco. They're absolutely gorgeous. And also... Uh, just like the two or three cafes that are in Saint-Germain where uh, a lot of the uh, later in the 1950s and 60s, a lot of the writers and, uh, writers and artists hung out, people go there as tourists because that's who used to hang out there. Sure. So they are able to charge more money. Sure, sure. So these are places that are so really worth seeing. So what's a typical lunch there? Do you know? Oh, I would say a typical lunch is probably about 30 euros. Yeah, so you it's, it's quite a bit more than... It, it's, it's, you know, I mean, it's a lunch, but it's, it's the, these are places, of course, so you can just go and get a coffee, you can get a snack, you can get a prefix lunch, you can get a real a la carte seafood platter, which is a lot more money. Yes. Uh, but all of this stuff comes directly from Brittany uh, because mm -hmm. it comes right off of the, the trains that come in uh, ev just about every hour from Brittany. So, and, and the other thing is there's a street called Rue de la Gaiety and there's a Metro stop Gaiety. Yeah, and Gaiety, at the same yeah. time that these cafes were started, this became the area after Montmartre that started having all the cabarets and theaters. And it still is one of the two parts of Paris that has the most theaters oh. and cabarets. So, and, and Paris is a city, I don't know how many actually it has, but 
per capita, it probably has more theater and more cinema than any other city in the world, I would oh, guess, wow. or almost. I mean, wow. I, I shouldn't say any other, but almost right. any other. But it's a lot. <clears throat> but a lot. And mm. a lot of these theaters are still in the Montparnasse area. Cool. So people go there, they go to the theater, or they go to the cinemas, which are much more recent, but there are zillions of cinemas in this area as well. And mm. then they go, of course, if you know, especially if you have a little money and you want to do a nice night out. You can go to one of these places, or you can just walk up and down Boulevard Montparnasse and Raspai and find all these other cafes and restaurants because it's an area that, what they would say in French, ça bouge. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a really lively area for nightlife and for seeing all of these things. Mm -hmm. It's not famous for its big museums or anything else. It has two or three of these little ones, like the Bordel Museum. And one recent one that I just want to mention because I've been there. And it has a place called the Fondation Cartier, mm -hmm. which was created by the people who own Cartier Jewelry. Yeah. And it's a, a foundation. It's actually on a Boulevard Raspail, which is a street that runs off. Uh, it's kind of a spoke out from where you have a, a Boulevard Montmartre, uh, Montparnasse, sorry. Uh, and uh, it is a foundation that has uh, <clears throat> exhibits of contemporary art. Ah, okay. And it used to be, the reason I know it, is because my first time of spending some months living in Paris, the American uh, Foundation was there, mm -hmm. the American Cultural Center. Ah. And what happened was that the American Cultural Center has moved. It's now in an area called Bercy, which is another part of Paris. Right. And the, the Cartier group, I, I'm not sure exactly why, but they decided instead of uh, destroying it to take it over, remodel it, make it into a more contemporary building, and turn it into a really interesting contemporary art museum. That's cool. So it, it's private, but it's really an interesting place to see. And then, of course, we have the two things that are the most historical in the area, and one of them is the cemetery. Yes. <clears throat> I and love old cemeteries. She loves old cemeteries. Mm -hmm. Well, most French people love cemeteries. That's why we have cool cemeteries. And and do you know we uh, like them? Do you know why that this is a uh, Montparnasse cemetery, like Père Lachaise, which is the huge, enormous, most first biggest cemetery, of course, in, in Paris, which is at the in the northeast of the city. Mm -hmm. Both of them were created in the 1820s. Mm. And uh, for the same reason as the big cemetery Terkabat here um, that Toulouse, we have, yeah. for a very interesting reason, which was that it was the first time that an ordinance was made to create public cemeteries. Because before that, all cemeteries were in the graveyards of churches. Right. And so this became an area which had originally been a farmland that had windmills for grinding wheat. And it was a couple of little hills. It was just kind of a vaguely hilly area. To me, Montparnasse is not really hilly very, uh, very much at all. Mm -hmm. But they took the city took over the uh, area uh, and they turned it into a cemetery because they wanted to empty out all of the other uh, churchyard cemeteries, which, of course, has to do also with the history of the catacombs uh, because that's what they did was what they created all of these public cemeteries. Mm -hmm. They... I guess a lot of the uh, smaller uh, churchyard graveyards were filled up, I would guess. I'm yes. not sure. Yes, I think that's what happened. They just they ran out of room. They ran out of room. The, the, the rule in France is even if you buy a plot in perpetuity, it's really for... Uh, 99 years. 99 right? years, right. And then after 99 years, you have to pay again for your plot. And... Uh, so they try to find descendants of the the people who are buried in in this plot, and sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. And if they if it's a grave that gets visitors, I've yeah. seen graves in France that has a that have a little uh, there's a they put a little marker right. on there, and that means come to the management of the cemetery. Oh, to to renew the papers, right? To renew the papers, and anybody who tries to make an inquiry as to whether they can bury another person in there, then they are identified as the owner of this plot, and they will be asked to pay for it again. And if they do, fine. But if they don't, then they have... Then it becomes public property. Then it becomes public property. Right, and, yeah. they, will, and they will remove the bodies and mm. consolidate somewhere else, you know. So it's kind of a, a little odd thing. I don't know if other countries have this, 
Um, but that's, that, that's that, how they it, take the, that they take. I don't know. I, that would be interesting to know. I don't know if there are other countries or in the States, if they take the bodies out after a certain amount of time, my guess is if you don't have a plot that is in perpetuity, maybe they do. I don't mm-hmm, know. But mm-hmm. what they don't do in the United States, which I know for a fact, and they do of course do in France. And I don't know about other European countries is they don't put one body on top of the other. Oh yeah, here you you usually bury. Uh, they usually dig up deep graves. They right. can be up to ten, twelve down. Right, and they're cemented. You know, that's it's all. It's 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 very very deep, and they put one coffin on top of the other. Right, but they build a floor in between. But then after a certain amount of years, I don't know how long well, they do collapse. I guess. Okay, this, this is, the, is we're getting this, morbid, this, right? This is the Halloween show. I, the Halloween so show. So we can. I guess this is okay to talk about this. Um, what happens is very often these graves are not watertight Uh and so water will pool in and will rot the wood. And so the floors in between these coffins are going to collapse. Uh And so if they, when they go, when they open the grave to bury a new person, they sometimes have to remove all the older coffins, rebuild the the kind of floors between, and it's it's a little bit convoluted. It's a little I mean, bit convoluted. unfortunately, there's been several <laughs> deaths in my family, so I've had to deal with this. Where the people who go to open the graves tell me, you know, well, we have to open it and see what we and find. See what you find because yeah. it's a it's a bit of a you know they don't know really. So, so, yeah. Okay. So Montparnasse, it's the second largest, life. yeah. <laughs> it's the second largest uh, cemetery in the city. The largest is Père Lachaise, then there's Montparnasse, and then there's Montmartre, believe it or not, which is actually the third biggest. Mm-hmm. And all three of them are, uh, and, and just to, to let people get an idea of how big that means, uh, 38, it's about 50 acres, Montparnasse Cemetery. That's it's 19 big. hectares, which yeah. is, and it's not nearly as big, of course, as Père Lachaise. Yeah. But uh, one of the things about these cemeteries, and, and just that your comment is clear, you know, it, it's interesting because obviously Americans don't think about cemeteries that way yeah. unless you've lived in France. Uh, the way they were designed starting in the 1820s was with this idea that actually came from England, believe it or not, of turning a cemetery into a park. Mm. And so they're designed so that people can visit them and stroll through oh, them of course. and have their trees and benches, which in the United States would never, ever exist because the cemetery is not meant as a place to visit. It's a place to visit only if your family is buried there. So uh, there's a whole That's atmosphere. True. In France, you do visit the cemetery visit cemeteries. just because it's interesting looking right and because there are famous people there that's true and of course uh one of the things about all three of these cemeteries being that it's paris is that they're filled with with lots of very famous people (laughs) yes right so we have each made our list of some of the famous people the ones we'd like to go visit we'd love to go visit you know it's like when you go to a cemetery you say you you ask when you enter this is something you can do because this is france and this is paris but not just in paris you go to the entrance and you get a map of the cemetery Mm -hmm. and on the map usually are indicated the places where famous people in Mm -hmm. any field are uh, and then you wander up and down the alleys and in and out and you go and look and you see because of course in uh, France like in many European countries the uh, it's not just simple markers which you have much more in the states it's big uh, mausoleums or very elaborate right. headstones or things like that right. so it's fun if you want to call it that, uh, to see <laughs> what has been designed for a specific person. Right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, um, and, and so therefore Montparnasse is one of the two important cemeteries that has famous people in Paris. Yep. So here we go, Annie. Okay. Okay. Tell me your, your famous people that you so, want to go see. So my famous people, of course, my famous people include mostly artists and, 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 uh, people like that. So, uh, among French, uh, famous people, I have, uh, Simone Signoret and Yves Montand, who were both, of course, actors and, actors, and yep. singers, that two, two people that I actually liked a whole lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have Apollinaire, the poet. Oh, very nice. Uh, Baudelaire, also. Oh, Baudelaire is there. Okay. Baudelaire is there. All right. You have de Maupassant, the writer. Uh-huh. You have Bourdel, the sculptor that I mentioned. Yeah. Sartre. Oh, Jean-Paul Sartre. Jean-Paul Sartre. I like his stuff. And, yep. his, and his mate, 
Um, Simone de Beauvoir. Simone de Beauvoir. Very good. And uh, a very famous uh, 20th century writer that I like a lot, uh, Marguerite Duras. Oh, yeah, she's great. So these are all people that I like to say hi to when yes. I go and visit in the cemetery there. And, and people go and they pay homage. I mean, they will bring a flower or a sign of that they've been there or something, right. you know. And, and there are places where you, you have whole collections of people who've made various donations. And of course, the staff removes them after a while. I mean, right. you know, it's kept clean, but it's... It's important, it's, it's part of French life that you visit cemeteries. And especially, so at Halloween in America, you spook yourself by right. like dressing up and stuff. But in France, it's, it corresponds to um, Hallowed Eve. So it's the, it's, it's the um, La Toussaint. Right. Okay, so La Toussaint is the... All Saints Day. All Saints Day. It's the time where you go visit the graves, you wash them, you repair anything that's uh, that needs to be f- repaired you bring flowers right. you you know you, and every year i do this i i go to several of the graves uh, that the family has in toulouse and and that's what we do and the flower that is used in france is the chrysanthemum that's right it's chrysanthemum which is very different from the states and of course it's always strange Mums. because uh in japan the chrysanthemum is the flower of long life and here it's the flower of putting on the death. graves you know? do not yes if you visit a French person don't bring them do yes. not bring them chrysanthemums, chrysanthemums or mums it's, no it's for cemeteries and it's a shame because I like them as a flower <laughs> well they're beautiful they can be very bright yeah they come in all kinds of colors but yeah and so this is this is a very um, different take on French culture also marks the, you know late October early November right. we also have a sort of uh, religious, celib- well, quasi-religious. I mean, people, even people who are not religious at all will go to the grave and, and pay respect. It seems to me it's more like, from what I know, of what happens in Mexico. Because that's Could what they be. do. In Mexico, they do a whole procession with All Saints Day. In fact, I think that some of the th- rituals of Halloween are very close to what they do. They take out, they make candies like skulls. They give out mm. sweets that look like skulls and crossbones. Uh, they go uh, to the cemeteries, but they do this whole kind of celebration. And um, I'm not exactly sure uh, what the uh, significance is, but it yeah. has to do with celebrating the dead. Yeah. But also I think it has to do with, co- it, it's like communicating with the spirits a little bit. You yeah, know? yeah. Which and, seems close to Halloween, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, and in France, it's more of a, well, I remember growing up uh, on all Saints Day, you were not supposed to play music. Oh, really? We were a very musical family, but that was the day where, you know, my mother oh. closed the piano and that was that. That oh, day there was no horsing around the piano, which my brother is a very good piano player. And so he was always coming up with silly tunes. And <laughs> and, uh, and so that was out. Um, it was a day where you dressed up and you went to the cemetery and you uh, behaved. And you, you know? behaved. Yes, yes, yes. That's what you had to do. Yeah, that's what you had to do. And so we still do this. There's no culinary, especially, you know, but there are family meals. You, Whoever lives close to where the family grave is will probably host a lunch uh-huh. or something where people can come. Um so anyway, so I've got my own list of there's famous your, people here, that I want to go visit. Um, there's a physicist, André-Marie Ampère. So this is the man. France used to be the country of science. In the 1900s, 1800s, France has so many wonderful scientists. It was just fabulous. Um, and the, the amperage is named after, after him. I mean, him. it's a big deal. If it's named after you, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. <laughs> yes. Um, something much lighter. The singer Michel Berger is uh, buried there. He had a very untimely death. Um, and I, I happen to like some of his songs. Um, the pastry chef that we mentioned in episode 34 on pastries, uh, Marie-André Carême. Yeah. Um, He's buried in Montparnasse. Yes. Um, the, I hope they leave him pastries. <laughs> that we, maybe. Who knows? Uh, the painter Degas, uh, Edgar Degas, is, uh, is there. The author Alexandre Dumas, the, the son. son. There were two of them. Uh, so the son is the one who wrote La Dame aux Camélias. Mm-hmm. Um, the, his father is the one who wrote the more famous uh, Three Musketeers and Monte Cristo and, and that. Um, another physicist, uh, Léon Foucault of the Pendulum. 
is is uh, buried there, and that's just a that's just a beautiful. I mean, I've seen pendulums, all, Foucault pendulums, all over. I don't even know what they are. Ah, you have to visit college campuses. Um, it's like a big long uh, rope. Well, it's not a rope; it's a steel with with a heavy ball at the bottom, and it demonstrates the rotation of the Earth hmm. because. The, p- the pendulum swings yeah. and you see it's like a clock you see the you see the the earth moving underneath the pendulum oh. it, and it shows you in very g- visible ways that we think we're standing still but we're not the planet you the mean. planet yeah. is rotating huh. and it shows you the rotation of the planet oh. it's it's very fun to to see uh, the cinematographer François Truffaut right. uh, is buried there. And the, the great thing about him is he's made a lot of very interesting French movies. Um, that I think America, uh, some Americans who are interested in foreign films usually have seen that's his right, films. Right, that's right. And Steven Spielberg was a great admirer right. of Truffaut. And he and had him in E.T. That, not, no, not in, e. a, in, a, in um, Encounters of the Encounters Third of Kind. Encounters of the Third Kind. Yes. Right. Uh, right. Uh, and he even let him speak French in it because uh, Truffaut was not comfortable speaking English. Right. And so he does uh, an appearance uh, and, in and just, French. And just to know that this year, uh, right now in Paris, there's a whole whole festival of Truffaut films because it's the 30th anniversary of his death. He died ah. at the age of 52 of a brain tumor, very, very young. Yes. And uh, his films are being re-released in new copies. And so it's go- going to go on for several months. There's a whole big deal about uh, the anniversary for Truffaut in yeah. Paris right now. No, oh, he, he was uh, definitely one of the more interesting right. and unusual um French cinematographers. Anyway, Emile Zola is also Zola. Uh, oh, buried uh, in Montparnasse. So a lot of very... I mean, the, the list is so long. Um, and I, I'll try and find pictures of the ones that we've mentioned and put them on johnnysinfrance.com uh, forward slash 39. So that's that's a great thing to do if you're in Paris around Halloween is is go visit one of these cemeteries. And uh, Yeah, I just, I, I just want to say that there are two streets right near there, um, on the east and on the uh, northern sides of the cemeteries, that are also really lovely because they have these little houses and little cafes. I mean, it's true that cemeteries in France are a, an experience. They're not the same as a cemetery in the United States. So, right. you know, you can make a day. In fact, I've taken people to Père Lachaise. It's like, this is what we're going to do today. We're going to go to the cemetery. Uh-huh. You know? <laughs> it's kind of weird, you know, when you think about it. No, Have lunch and go to the cemetery, you know. <laughs> Sorry, I just want to add that. You know? <laughs> no, I think it's, you know, it, we, I mean, this is human, this is the human condition. We all die someday. And I think we need to honor whatever traditions make it a little bit less horrible yeah that that fact of life and so the french have decided that we want to do it by having interesting tombstones interesting sayings on the tombstones uh more and more i'm saying tombstones that will indicate what the person's hobby was oh yeah you know yeah um you know you see fishermen it's just like you do in america but but in france it's it's on a small construction right. it's like a yeah, you have to go to the website and look at the pictures. I, I think, but I think that uh, historically, it also has to do with uh, uh, the difference between a Catholic environment and a Protestant environment. Because uh, could be. I think in Protestant, uh, mostly Protestant cemeteries, it's considered to be um, perhaps better to make something simple. That's my mm-hmm, understanding mm-hmm, of the difference. Mm-hmm. You know, so yeah. that you wouldn't make this kind of big mausoleum type thing. You know, you just, yeah, just very modestly. Let's put a marker down, you know. Yeah. Um, so it, it's very interesting to see. Yeah, and I remember yeah. as a as a kid visiting, and um, you know, it was a place where we played hide and go seek right. with my siblings. And and it's and I know of... people who studied for their exams in high school in the cemetery. Right, because it's a place where you can sit and it's quiet. You well, yeah, it's usually it's quiet. quiet. Yeah. <laughs> they usually I mean they close at night, so you have to know right. if you're planning on doing that, you know, visiting uh on Halloween or something, it's going to be closed at night. So don't go too late. They usually close at 7 p.m. or because 8 p.m. or something. Then it would really get creepy. Yeah, yeah. And it's I mean it's locked down and you're not supposed to climb the fence and right. go in. You know, mm-hmm. it's it's 
it's protected uh, against vandalism and stuff like that. So, so there we go from our cemetery to on one end to, to the catacombs <laughs> at the other. And, and of course, I, I know you're going to talk about it because you have visited the inside. Yeah, yeah. But it's interesting to know that the catacombs uh, is actually a space that is part of the enormous Swiss cheese that exists under the city of Paris that mm-hmm. is huge amounts of tunnels that were dug out by the Romans during the Gallo-Roman civilization, which means basically up to about the year 350 AD. Mm. Uh, And uh, this was continued during the Middle Ages because all the magnificent buildings in Paris that are made of this lovely limestone, which is pretty much everything, uh, is dug out right underneath everybody's feet. So everywhere you go... And I don't know, I've, I've read it, but I didn't mark it down this time, but there's hundreds of kilometers of tunnel actually yeah. dug out under the city. And of course, there are two underground rivers that run as well. So it's, it's enormous. And of course, if you, uh, uh, if you want to hide and you can get into the catacombs, you can actually hide. And apparently that is, of course, what happened in the Middle Ages. Uh, but you have to be careful because... I don't know if you know this, so I was just reading this online. It's become very fashionable for young people to try to find entrances into the catacombs and bring bottles of, of wine and stuff with them and have parties down below. Oh, wow. And what happens is uh, they have to be very careful. And the, the city doesn't, the Paris doesn't quite know what to do about this because they keep trying to block off all these entrances mm-hmm. because they're afraid that some of them are really going to wander off and get lost. Mm-hmm. And you can really, really get lost uh, yeah. in the hundreds of kilometers that yeah, they have under there. It, you know? uh, it's a little bit, it boggles the mind. When you visit the catacombs uh, in Paris, uh, Denfer de Rochereau is, is the, the entrance. Place. The entrance. Um, you you of course it's you know they've made they have a proper door and they've made an entrance and they give you you know steps and banisters and all of that it's it's very well uh, developed for tourists and there are apparently so many people that go down there that you frequently have to wait an hour or two yes just to get in yes uh, it's first come first serve you can't right. you can't reserve no. in advance um, going down is pretty easy because it's all downhill. <laughs> Coming back up, it will give you a little bit of a workout. Um, I don't know how many steps it is. It's a few hundred steps. I is mean, that it's much? not. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's uh, similar to going up, up to the top of Notre Dame. Yes, it's that sort of, you know. Um, but it's very, very well worth it. Uh, we went um, a few years ago again with a young daughter who uh <laughs> had uh, you, you know growing up with halloween she had always seen these fake plasticky skulls and bones and all that but you know we had to tell her this, this is the real thing and so what they do is they used to empty the cemeteries right and <clears throat> p- place the osier the, you know the bones that were right. left they stack them. That's right. Uh, deep and high, and in in all the cavities around the tunnel. And so you're in a tunnel that's maybe a, be- a meter wide. It can be wider or narrower in places. It's lit, but not very bright. You know, it's got some lights, but it's not like daylight or anything. Um, and they have plaques that indicate where they got these bones. Uh So they emptied various cemeteries. Cemeteries, And they would tell you uh, on the plaques, it says this is from section such and such of of cemeteries, such and such. Um, And they're stacked very nicely. Um, (laughs) It's, it's, it's pretty in a way, you know, it's, it's really beautiful. I don't remember if photography is allowed in there, but, Probably not flash, I would guess, but um, I'll, I'll try and verify it okay. and put it on the website. Just just mentioning that, of course, uh, for people to understand that this is from the 19th century that they started yeah. this. This is not from uh, prior times. No. So this is when they started making these big public cemeteries. And since there were too many bodies buried everywhere... 
they decided to use these tunnels as a space to store them rather than burning them up or destroying them. Right. So uh, I don't know. I, I was just wondering, as you were saying that, I wonder if a family that has been for many generations in Paris can find out if they can do any kind of DNA testing to see if there's a bone that belongs to one of their ancestors. Um, I don't know weird. that, but it would be very difficult because, because they're all, the they're same, all huh? stacked up yeah. and nothing looks more like a skull than another, than another skull. skull. So it's just like a right. bunch of them. And it's not just the, the skulls. You They stack up all sorts the of bones. The femurs and the tibias yeah, and yeah, all of that. Right? Yeah. And they keep similar bones in together. Si together in a stack. And so it's... It's visually pleasing in a kind of creepy kind of way. <laughs> right. Yeah. I hope they don't decorate them with scarves and hats and things like that. No, no, there's nothing like that. And you get to walk through and it, it probably takes an hour or two to see the whole thing. Um, it's well worth a visit. It's very like when you're walking around, you think, how many people is that? Yeah. That is a lot of people. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's, if you have family buried, you know, where the cemetery moved, because the cemeteries have kept track of, right. you know, what, what they moved the bodies right. to and where they are and all that. So if you still wanted to go pay your respects for your ancestors from the 1600s uh, in the catacombs, I guess you could. I, it's interesting because obviously this is very different from <clears throat> the catacombs in Rome, mm. which of course are from early Christian times. Oh yeah, that's because not, it's this not is that old. technically not considered to be catacombs because nobody was originally buried there. This is simply right, where right. they put all of the bones of all of these people. But it's what it's called. But so. it is what it's called. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. what they call it. And and just to mention, because I know I had mentioned it to you earlier this morning, uh, that in 1944, the head of the French Resistance in the organization called the FFI, which is the uh, United French Resistance. At the beginning of 1944, which is when they started really moving and doing activity in Paris, he set up his headquarters. The man was Henri Paul Tanguy, and he set up his headquarters in the catacombs. And mm -hmm. uh, apparently the Germans did not find them. Maybe mm. the resistance, maybe the fact that there were all these bones meant that the radio uh, emitters were not traced or something like that. It's very interesting. And now there is this, one of the side streets right at the uh, uh, car at the intersection of Denfer Rochereau is named after him in honor mm, of the mm. fact that this is uh, one other use for the catacombs, you know, yeah, yeah. as a place of, of hiding resistance. But what ups, I mean, the whole thing of young people today going down there to party somehow that creeps me out. Yeah, that's not so nice. I mean, it's kids will be kids, but you you don't want to do that. I think it's just fine if you pay your entrance, go see them where it's lit and uh, traced, and you know where you're going, and you're not going to get lost. And you're not going to get lost. Nothing bad will happen to you. You know, it's it's a much better way to visit that. I think it's a good thing to do on a nice day when it's not nice outside, and you feel like, okay, what am I going to do if I had enough time? I mean, I've seen enough museums. What do I do now? Maybe I'll go to the catacombs. Yeah. And I think if you're with children and you don't mind a little bit of a, you know, creepy kind of atmosphere, it's a very fun thing to visit. It's, you know, it's, it's very um, sobering for children to be like, wow, people, these are real <laughs> people. They're not Halloween decorations, yeah. you know? So it's, it's a, you know, it's. I think it's it's a good education. It was good for our daughter. I don't know if it's good for every child, but for us, it was it was a good thing to do. So there you go. So there you go. So Montparnasse. Uh, uh, another thing also is I have a good friend who stayed in Paris recently, and she said that Montparnasse uh, was a great place to stay for her in Paris because it was not as expensive as some of the other super downtown things. And she found some very nice hotels in that area, and it was easy to get to everywhere there, from there, are, there. There are two parts of Montparnasse that have lots of hotels. One is very close to the train station, mm -hmm. but it's a big area. And since it's an area that has uh, a lot of activity, there are lots of hotels around there. Right. And the other is... But it's not going to be quiet. I mean, there's going to be no, cars and no. trucks and all sorts of things right. going through there. But there's in another the area that is actually the area closer to uh, denfer mm -hmm. uh and and where all of these very nice brasseries are. And yes, there are lots of hotels. Sometimes people don't realize... I know a lot of people who have never actually been in the 14th arrondissement. It happens that 
it's a place that I have stayed, and so I find it very nice. It doesn't have th- that much historical activity, but it's true that if you stay there, you can easily get on any bus or any metro line right. and go pretty much everywhere you want. Yes, it's it's it would be a I think it would be a decent place to if you're going to be in Paris for a few days. It might be a decent place to to stay because you will have a lot of restaurants not so many touristy restaurants per se but to restaurants where local people eat you and, know, and eat. it is actually really close to the sixth it's really close to the latin quarter and right. saint germain it's not that far away depending on which right. part you stay in so it's really not bad at all yeah yeah so a, a nice walk around montparnasse nice walk around uh, maybe stay there go try some of the historical bra- brasserie um, beautiful places. Beautiful places. A couple uh, of tiny little uh, artists' museums that are different, so they won't be crowded, you r- know? Right, right. So that would be a good choice, too. And, of course, go see the cemetery. Go see the cemetery. Yeah, even if you don't feel up to going down all those steps and the seeing the catacombs, really, the cemetery, you have to see a French cemetery while you're here. It's, and this is a nice one to see. Yes, th- this is a particularly good one. It's well kept um i've seen lots of pictures i'll put lots of pictures on the website you'll you'll see it's it's an interesting cultural um visit it's a nice part of paris that is not the first a list but it's a good place to visit yeah yeah i would i would have to agree okay elise i think we're done with uh, montparnasse we're done with creepy uh- <laughs> We're done with our M's, our three M's. <laughs> That's right. We've we've talked we've talked about them. Well, listeners, I want to remind you that if you would like to uh, be very nice to us and help support the show, and if you're going to be buying stuff from Amazon anyway, um, go to joinusinfrance.com forward slash Amazon. Click on your country flag, and uh, we you you pay exactly the same price you would have without doing that. And we get a small commission, which helps us keep the show going. So thank you very much. And I think we're done for today, Elise. We're done. All right. We'll talk to you next week. Bye. Au revoir.